Thanks. <laughs> Um, hi everybody, um, thank you so much to um, Claire and Rachel for inviting me. Um, delighted to be here, not much idea who I'm talking to in the void, but um, nonetheless uh, uh, very excited to be talking to you about this topic, Utopian Hope in Dark Times. Um, I mean, I've, I've got a paper that's um, quite a traditional sort of literary critical type paper, if you like, um, although I appreciate maybe I'm talking to um, interdisciplinary colleagues across the faculty and I'm, I'd be happy to take any questions um, a bit more on popular culture, film, TV, music, that kind of thing, because that's what I'm also working on as well. But I just thought I'd start with um, a, a poignant personal anecdote. Um, we're all being tested in these dark times. We have been for a number of years, even prior to the pandemic. And I think everyone's experience during lockdown and COVID um, has been traumatising to different degrees. Um, and personally, I've, I've had to really dig deep and test some of the thoughts I have about utopian hope and um, the intellectual ideas I've been writing about. Um, my sister passed away four weeks ago now and her funeral was just two weeks ago, actually. Um, and so it's really actually kind of it tests your mettle, you know, can we rely on our academic and scholarly ideas at, at times of great kind of emotional and, and psychological distress to some extent without any <laughs> professional training in that area. Um, OK, so without further ado, then I want to ask today how the idea of utopia helps us to galvanise political literary readings. Despite the seemingly relentless dystopian nature of these issues, contemporary writers, I think, are responding by using utopian registers in their fiction, anticipating alternative ways of imagining subjectivity, community and historical modes of belonging through formal and stylistic innovation. Literary scholars such as Frederick Jameson and Peter Boxall have commented on this distinctly so-called utopian turn in 21st century Anglophone writing. And I think we can see this in a number of figures, some of whom you may well be familiar with yourselves. Uh, Juliana Spar, Ned Yocrafor, David Mitchell, Nalo Hopkinson, China Mieville, figures like Jennifer Egan, Kim Stanley Robinson, Jim Crace, Maggie G, Ali Smith, Harry Kunzru, and Emily St. John Mandel. And I think that this has been matched by a similar interrogation of hope as an index of political anticipation in influential theoretical works by um, thinkers such as Lynn Segal, my colleague at Birkbeck, uh, Terry Eagleton, Lauren Ballant and David Harvey. But before I try and answer this question of how they can help us to galvanise our readings, I think it's also worth pointing out, um, Rachel, next slide, please. Thank you very much that the discourse of utopianism has seen a massive resurgence over the last 12 years since the um, global financial crisis in 2008 formalised a long economic downturn and political and social retrenchment into austerity in the UK as well as elsewhere. And we saw a cycle of protests, occupations and struggles in 2011, which I think were really unlike anything we'd seen since the Cultural Revolution in um, May 1968 following the student worker protests in uh, Sorbonne in Paris. The number of student activists and other youth led protest movements, which um, now, of course, includes the rhythmatic decentralised extinction rebellion movement, as well as the Black Lives Matter campaign uh, dating back to 2014, often um, make explicit reference to those utopian slogans from 1968. Another world is possible, demand the impossible, la lutte continue. And in the graffiti banners and protest chants of recent years, we hear that radical energy in slogans such as give us back our future from the anti tuition fee protests in the UK in 2010 and student occupations, calls for a general strike, assertions that another Oakland is possible, system change, not climate change, be realistic, demand the impossible. Um, next slide, please, Rachel. And I think one of the things that usually gets forgotten in a lot of the talk in literary and cultural circles around the resurgence of dystopian imaginaries, particularly reproductive dystopias, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, the recent new instalment, the TV adaptation and so on, 
is that some of our most canonical dystopias, um, her novel looks back, of course, to George Orwell's 1984, but actually much earlier than that to Jack London's um, The Iron Heel. What gets forgotten is the paratexts, the narrative frameworks, the footnotes, the prefaces. I think we need to remind ourselves that each of these dystopian stories is actually narrated from a post dystopian future. And in some cases with the Iron Heel, it's an explicitly utopian future looking back at the violence and struggles of the past. The editor's preferences, the scholarly footnotes with um, The Handmaid's Tale, for example, it's framed around the conference of Gileadian studies, um, which looks back to a distant period of, of history. And I think that attention to this kind of textual detail is important. That's why the work of literary scholars matters, particularly when these texts become um, uh, important and popularised in popular culture. And I think we need to think more carefully about the kinds of non-contemporaneous timescales that are being invoked at the formal as well as the generic levels here. Um, and that can think through the entanglement between the utopian and the dystopian. OK, uh, next slide, please, Rachel. The writers that I've been studying over the past few years, I think, offer a vital message in their works, no matter how dystopian some of these stories and narratives might seem at the surface level. I think it's important um, and the, the kind of work I do can be seen within a tradition of interdisciplinary utopian studies. Um, the literary version of which tends to privilege depth hermeneutics, so it's about digging down and kind of excavating formal properties within the text. Um, they, remind, they remind us that we have to remember how to hope, even when things might seem at their lowest ebb. Uh, it's no coincidence that utopian and dystopian novels emerge out of the same impulse to critique their present socio-political conditions of production. And we need to read them as two sides of um, the same coin. They're extrapolating from present circumstances, either the worst of all worlds or perhaps the best of all worlds, but usually somewhere in between. And it can get very muddy and very ambiguous. They inspire us, I think, to be more bold and imaginative in our political demands. So um, I think next slide, Rachel, if I can. Thanks. When um, so I look at formal properties in particular, when a, when a writer like John McGregor thinks about the traumatising, seemingly dystopian, I guess, experiences of alcoholism, poverty, homelessness and mental illness, um, which comes, I mean, there are elements of those in If Nobody Speaks, but it comes up more, I would say, in Even the Dogs, his novel from 2010. Or when we have David Mitchell's characters sliding into surreal alternate topographies of violence, predation and insanity across various books, Ghost Written, Cloud Atlas, The Bone Clock, Slade House. There's a bristling of, of menace, sometimes apocalyptic, sometimes not, but I think there's also um, this sense of utopian hope and possibility. These alternate topographies and timescales of possibility that I trace speak to a re-emergence in the 21st century British novel. I, I'm, I'm elsewhere too, but the book that this talk is based around is, is just focusing on the British novel. Um, uh, yeah, so they, they speak to this kind of re-emergence of the utopian imagination, I think and what the British novelist Megan Hunter has called the unknown nature of the future. So um, I guess my argument then is that what brings these writers together for me um, is this shared interrogation of the lived experience of time, a temporality and also historical time. And I think they reveal a series of radically non-linear, disjunct, pluralised and alternative temporal constructions. They disrupt the solidity of the, the real, of what we would have thought of to be mimetic realism within the naturalised genre of realist so-called literary fiction through these non-linear and distinctively utopian ruptures, shifts and breaks. And in these texts, then the present becomes malleable as redeemed pasts and anticipated futures eddy within a roiling depiction of temporal experience that uh, what really fascinated me was just how often it blurred the secular and the sacred and this delinearized sense of time is given aesthetic expression uh, through non-mimetic experiments with um, narrative voice and structure. 
So what do I mean by all this? It's it's hard to get across in a in a short half hour talk, but I'll just pick out a few little formal devices, hopefully as a sketch, so you can follow some of these ideas. In uh, the text that you can see here, John McGregor's If Nobody Speaks of Remarkable Things, there is, for example, the use of the even, um, the, the time of the angels, as Frank Commode described it, which gives us an ontological loosening of um, mimetic realism. Rachel, if you click again, I think maybe a quote might come up. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. So you get these kind of punctured moments in the text where the normal sort of linear chronological time or even the narratological temporality is deliberately broken and we move into a different order of time. There's a sort of ontological loosening where time stands still and the nunc movens of live time comes into contact with the nunc stands of eternity. Um, this comes up in another example in um, Rachel, next one, please. Maybe if you click twice, we might see the. Um, yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, Maggie G's novel, The Flood. She uses in uh, an epilogue and a, and a prologue, which kind of bookends her story of, of a flood fiction of, of um, a, a flood to um, a city like London. This kind of first person plural we, which gives us this omniscient um, homo diegetic narrator speaking from a moment, as we can see here, in which time is somehow exterior to ordinary live time of the novel's characters. Looking down on the events of a ravaged earth like Homeric gods tinkering in the meagre affairs of mortals, this narratorial device um, implicates Maggie G's reader within a kind of Empyrean space time described in explicitly utopian terms. It's called the other city, the city of dreams. And in establishing this um, collective necro narratorial perspective, it's somehow beyond historical time. It's beyond even um, the, the limits of an individual person's death. We are then capable of seeing, um, as she calls it, the whole of the road, the totality of time stretching back across 3000 human generations. And this framework, I think, raises the question of this idea of exteriority, which I borrowed quite a bit um, or I developed, if you like, the idea from Peter Osborne's excellent readings of, um, of Walter Benjamin and, and others um, from the politics of time. I think it was published back in the late 90s. Um, this idea of kind of exteriority, how is it possible to be outside of time as well as within li lived time? Uh, and, and, it, and in the case of Maggie G, a novel that explicitly references Virginia Woolf and particularly the, the kind of modernist time consciousness of things like the Kew Gardens short story, because this place is set in Kew Gardens. Um, we get a sort of Wolfian modernist time consciousness. It's multi-stranded. It's even multi-species. Um, and that's something I'll come back to in a bit. Um, yeah, next slide, please, Rachel. So those are just a couple of examples of formal narratological devices that I look at in um, this book, which came out of my PhD many years ago and was published in uh, 2019. And I, I refer to them as moments of possibility. That is, for me, these are textual moments in which stylistic and generic registers are established only then to be subsequently cleaved apart, confounding the reader's generic expectations and experimenting with formal techniques that specifically relate to our, our experience of time. In these moments, capitalist ordinal time comes to a stop and a plurality of alternative possible times, as well as the social worlds that contain them, come into focus. But in addition to bringing together novels, which I think arguably foreground these kinds of odd shifts in time, I think the project also demonstrates that we need to develop a coherent reading approach in which to understand these kinds of narratives. Um, when I started the project back in the mid 2000s, it was a kind of nascent new century for contemporary literary studies. Um, and even though things have you know, developed quite a bit since then, I still think there's an emerging set of aesthetic and political concerns that haven't yet crystallised. They're, they're still kind of gelatinous and fluid, and we're still trying to refine and develop the right voc critical vocabularies to, through which we can talk about them. And one of the most um, striking developments in post-millennial British fiction, but also American fiction, which I work on a little bit, 
has been the number of um, writers, supposedly sort of realist literary writers who borrow from genre. So there's been a huge blurring of the boundaries between things like horror, science fiction, fantasy, crime and literary fiction. And there's lots of people I could point you towards who write very excellent um, analyses of that. OK, next one, please, Rachel. Um, so how how do we develop a kind of method for understanding these complicated timescales? Um, I think that they um, suggestively respond to and also reshape the inequalities and unevenness of 21st century social and political life in an explicitly and distinctly utopian direction. And my guide here really was the German utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch. He may be familiar to any of you who have come across utopian studies before or German philosophy, but he's really quite a marginalised figure beyond that field. Um, many of his works have still not been translated into English and his major opus, Magnus Opus, The Principle of Hope, was really only translated in the 1980s. So in that regard, he still remains to be um, uh, you know, kind of repurposed, if you like, or his ideas still remain to be fleshed out as a, as a viable critical method, I think, not just for literary studies, he writes about popular culture um, and a whole range of different aesthetic forms. He has an idea in um, Erbschafti's Zeit, which was um, published in 1935 in Zurich, translated as Heritage of Our Times, and it's um, a, a concept of Ungleichzeitigkeit, which translates either as non-contemporaneity, as I use it, uh, or also non-simultaneity. Um, and I take this idea from Bloch and I try and use it as a philosophical frame, which I think can help us to understand multiple overlapping contradictory time signatures as I find them in these novels. They clash, they coalesce within the present moment. Um, perhaps a more familiar figure to you might be the, the model that Raymond Williams talks about in the idea of dominant emergent residual um, ideologies and ideological formations. So it's not dissimilar to that, but it's got its own distinct merits, I think. Um, and I think attuning our readings to these kinds of non moments of non-contemporaneity can help us to disambiguate complex formal and aesthetic strategies um, that these texts give us for grasping the present moment. And as a, a research centre clustered around the ideas of the contemporary, you're going to be familiar with how hard it is, you know, for us to analyse and to teach the contemporary period to our students. So I think the question of method is really important here, um, you know, to try and give us um, a sort of robust foundation upon which we can approach very recently and emerging ideas and concerns in clusters of aesthetic texts. Um, that's my cat having a coffee fit in the background. Um, I mean, one of the things that I'm going to talk about um, in a moment is um, a lot of my work has developed out of kind of Marxist literary criticism. And one of the reasons I think that's important to note is that um, a lot of Marxist critics and Ernst Bloch particularly look back to pre-capitalist modes of experience. Um, E.P. Thompson has a wonderful essay on time where he gathers um, evidence from poet poetry, other um, archival documents of people talking about time and timekeeping and what time felt like. And capitalism fundamentally reshapes the lived experience of time for workers as well as for capitalists. Um, so it's really important, I think, to remember that there was a different understanding of time before industrialization, before the kind of capitalist um, project of imperialism, accumulation on the global scale and, and so on. And that many of the texts I'm looking at gesture towards what that might look like. Um, and if that sounds a bit outlandish, it really isn't, because there are so many post-apocalyptic narratives these days um, and, and zombie apocalypses and disaster stories where we imagine what the world would look like if you know some catastrophe occurred and and we get a glimpse of what life after capitalism might look like and of course remember frederick jameson's famous quip that it's easier to imagine the end of the whole world than it is the end of capitalism so i'm, I'm kind of pushing back against that idea a little bit i think um next slide please rachel so before I go any further, um, I'd like to insist on a distinction between literary utopias and uh, what I'm calling literary utopianism. And this is where I really draw on the rich resources in utopian studies, which I mentioned is a very interdisciplinary set of fields. It's 
it's scholars working in sociology, political theory and um, political philosophy, people working in art and architecture, cultural studies, media theory and so on. So it's a fantastic set of resources that haven't always made their way back into literary studies, I don't think. Literary utopias um, as, a, as a kind of genre, often referred to as a sort of subgenre of a broader understanding of the umbrella of science fiction, although obviously they predate the birth of science fiction. If you go back to Thomas More's 15, 16 originary text, um, we, we may think we know what that means to, to a certain extent, although we can argue around the edges. It tends to be um, a, a novel which privileges ref, uh, or reflects upon the idea of an improved society whether the, that might be located at the edges of the known world in the island utopias of the Renaissance period, um, or whether it's under the surface of the earth in late 19th century hollow earth stories, whether it's set in the distant Ukrainian future of, of um, Martian utopias, uh, popular in the late 19th century, um, set on advanced Martian worlds, thousands of years more developed and superior to human civilization. But what I'm talking about is a way of reading and what if we get time in the discussion, what I'd really love to hear uh, from 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 anybody who's here or, or feel free to ask me about it is how this might be used, not just in the specific writers I put together in this book, but actually I think this method goes further than that. And I'm currently trying to develop it in a set of um, readings of contemporary sci fi film and cinema and think how cinema and film studies might be able to use this kind of hermeneutic. So, um, OK, it's a literary utopianism for our purposes here is a qualitatively different kind of text from those kind of utopian worlds set in the future or set in space um, that we might think of when we first hear the word utopia. Um, OK, so. Uh, yeah, it, it's about identifying um, shifts in narrative time. It's about locating non mimetic borrowings from genre, particularly speculative and sci fi, without necessarily being a science fiction. It's about an ecstatic relationship with apocalyptic nature. Um, and it's about, I think, a kind of rejuvenation of narrative form. And I'm not the only person who's tried to argue that kind of 21st century British fiction is seeing a really impressive revival of, of formal um, and, and literary experimentation at the moment and and so I see it as part of a, a response I guess to you know the the, the very changed socio-political historical moment in which we live which is a moment of ongoing and enduring crisis and it's not yet clear what will emerge out of that moment so as you see in the early decades of the 20th century I guess with modernist avant-garde there's you would imagine and expect for there to be even more cultural flourishing over the coming years in response to the political crises that we're all living through. OK, um, next slide, please, Rachel. So, yeah, I, I probably just got another like 10 minutes maybe of, a, of an example. I thought I'd talk to you about one of the texts I really like that I've been teaching on uh, one of our M on our MFA programme at Birkbeck, and that's Joanna Cavenna's 2010 novel, The Birth of Love. I don't know how widely known it is, published with Faber, but it is a very beautiful text. Um, and I developed this idea out of, um, uh, I think I got it from an interview that she made about um, birth being a wormhole in time. So I'll, I'll can you just click um, maybe four times? There was a kind of animated sequence. Perfect, thank you. So this is um, a book that is deliberately harking back to the modernist novels in a day. The whole story is set in one day, like Ju Ulysses, uh, Joyce's Ulysses from 1922, like Wolfe's Mrs. Dalloway from 1925, or the 1928 sections of Faulkner's The Sound and The Fury, we have four narrative strands which I've listed here for you because it gets a bit complicated um, and they all take place during this 24 hour period. And the main focus of the novel is um, the number two is the scene of poor Bridget Hayes, 42 years old, who's just gone into labour with her second child uh, in a kind of contemporary London setting. And she spends the entire novel in labour and it's the most amazing description of, of labour I've come across. Um, and as you can imagine, pretty gruelling. Um, and in addition to that modernist um, kind of novel in a day, there's also, um, next slide please, Rachel. 
uh, the, the timelines are connected through a kind of nested narrative framework that reminds us, I think, of David Mitchell's Matryoshka Russian doll structure that became famous um, when he first published Cloud Atlas, um, but also other um, literary precursors that, that Kavena has talked about in interviews. So things like Journey to the End of the Night from 1932, uh, the Alexandria Quartet from the late 50s and Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night, A Traveller. So we've got a clearly experimental narrative structure. Um, I mean, modernist precursors, sure, but explicitly postmodernist um, uh, novelistic structures here too. So we're obviously experimenting with those. And Kavena uses these to bear, uh, to, to critique and think about the existential issue of motherhood and the act of childbirth. OK, um, next slide, please. Uh, and this is what she said in an interview, which I think really struck me when I first read it. I found birthing my own children such a moment of gory apotheosis, as if everything comes together at the point at which a new life begins. Family history, the lives of ancestors, the coincidences that cause two people to meet and birth a child. Reality, fantasy, dream and everyday life. To me, it was as if everything was happening at the same time as if a wormhole had opened up, past, present, future, fantasy and reality have merged. So the gory apotheosis of birth, as she describes, is, is similar to other events I look at in my book, including death. Um, it's both unique, <laughs> we only die once, you only give birth to that specific child once, but it's universal in the sense that even if we don't give birth at some point, we have all been birthed to some extent, in, in some kind of way. And it draws together this time scale of all of humanity from the ancestors through to kind of future images of, of, of human species. Um, the point of view focus of Bridget in her labour offers us an alternative approach to thinking about subjectivity in which the Cartesian mild, uh, sorry, Cartesian mind-body dualism, which sets her rational consciousness against the primordial demands of her labouring body, is really exploited to very interesting effect. Um, it gives us literary expression to an ongoing feminist critique of the fallacy of modernity's singular time of linear progress. Um, next quote, please. It's something that Claire Colbrook has written about um, feminism, she says, is challenging this idea of progressive and unfolding linear time uh, to recognise other models of selfhood than that of the rationally con self-constituting man. And that this is a necessarily utopian gesture of rethinking time. It draws upon a past that has never actually been lived, a virtual past that remains in potentia. So uh, as I've highlighted here then, um, in this narrative, in this non-narrative conception, sorry, Colbrook writes that time is an open hole where the past can always produce new potentials for new futures, which in turn open up new pasts. And each moment of time bears the potential for a sense of the whole of time, all of time. I mean, for me, having been trained formally in, in German philosophy with, with people like Benjamin Adorno, Horkheimer, Ernst Bloch, this really speaks to their understanding of the redemption of historical time. Benjamin's theses on the philosophy of time really um, become relevant here, I think. And that um, secularised, but also re-sacralised understanding of, of um, of the Redeemer appearing, uh, you know, at some anticipated moment. Um, so in that sense, it's quasi messianic, to say the least. So um, jo uh, jo Joanna Cavena's um, book gives us um, a lot of interesting themes that we can um, kind of explore. But I wanted to just come back to this, the different timescales. I think the next slide, please, Rachel. Um, keep clicking. Yeah, so there's a moment. So one of the strands of the novel, the kind of sci fi futuristic bit is where a political prisoner who's living in an authoritarian dystopian world, very reminiscent of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, Orwell's 1984, but also Yevgeny Zamyatin's um, 1921 novel We, she leaves a hyper technologized high rise city 
as with we, there's surveillance everywhere. It's drenched in really oppressive light. There is nowhere to hide. Um, birth has been um, outsourced to um, a kind of manufactured um, production, if you like. And, and a group of political prisoners who um, revere a female kind of deity uh, escape to the Lofoten Islands in Norway. Um, and the moment when they arrive is really interesting. And I quoted it here because it really is a moment of birth. They arrive in the crate, sweaty and vile. They pass through a passage or tunnel, um, an incessant beating of the waves, um, and then um, sort of appear on the beach of this um, island. And the image of the island um, is starkly used to juxtapose the kind of high tech city that they've escaped from. Um, as they move in this dreamlike noctambulation, then um, we can't help but be reminded, I think, of childbirth and of the most compelling central strand of the novel during which Bridget is in labour. But there's also, if you click again, Rachel, there's an interesting and uncanny echo. I don't think it's intentional at all. I'm not saying that, but it is interesting to read side by side the final lines of Ernst Bloch's The Principle of Hope, which arguably are the most famous lines of, of that three volume set. Um, where he talks about the utopian homeland, Heimat, as being something which shines into the childhood of all and in which no one has yet been. Typical Blockian fashion, he gives us these very obscure images that don't make any sense in temporal terms. Um, they pull into odd conjugation the disjunct temporalities of collective memory, the childhood of all, the unknown utopian futurity of the noch nicht or the not yet, in which no one has yet been. And it combines these different timescales that are also encapsulated within Jewish messianism, um, which he was very influenced by in his early years, in which the utopian future redeems the historical past. As Ehud Luz has said, um, the, the present time is used to create a totality that transforms the meaning of objective time through the messianic experience. Um, OK, next slide, please. So, yeah, I'll skip that one. That's from a, an image of Zamiatin's We. Thank you. Yep. So this messianic experience of time is made possible by a specific narrative locale or chronotope, the Arctic island of dissidents um, at um, Lofoten, the archipelago up north of Norway. Um, OK, let's see. So, um, I've, I've referred to this as a kind of micro utopia. I mean, really, you could also call it a utopian enclave, which is something um, Jameson writes about and many other scholars have talked about utopian enclaves as well. Um, and I think it, to try and make sense of how that functions in the novel, I, I had to kind of step sideways and look at some of Kavanagh's other writings. And here, the Ice Museum, which I think I'm right in saying might have been the first thing she published, although it was written after several novels that she hadn't succeeded in getting published. Um, but it was a kind of funded trip up to um, the Arctic Circle, and it was in search of the lost land of Thule, this mythological supposed island um, dating back to, uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, it's, a, it's a very ancient idea, put it that way, described as a, a place of dreams. And she, she kind of interviewed fishermen and local teachers and local people and went to pubs and asked them, have you heard of Thule? What did your mother tell you about it? What is this place? Um, it's a really interesting non-fictional work. Um, uh, it, it evokes, I think, the irresistible image of the utopian island from the Renaissance utopias, which were always at the edge of the maps, um, or even, you know, that the kind of period of cartographic transformation, moving from classical antiquity to the early modern system. Uh, and in myth, it's suggestive of ancient cultures that lie somehow outside of the time of Western modernity. So this is one of those pre-capitalist temporalities I mentioned a moment ago. As a Norwegian philosopher tells Kavena, the, the idea of Thule um, gives us, as he says, a different relation to time. Something gets away from you, time bound no longer. It's just timelessness. And this different relation to time that Ultima Thule represents, I think, is, is how we might read the, the small escaped colony of people who want to give birth in the birth of love. These um, political prisoners who have decided to struggle away from the city and try and return to pre-industrial methods of small scale 
agriculture and survivalism. They're trying to learn how to grow crops uh, and hunt deer um, and kind of tap back into those primordial ties of the species. They settle, as, as she describes, into a very ancient rhythm. They measure time through the passing of the seasons, a seasonal calendar, if you like, with ancient ties outside of industrialization. Um, OK, I think last slide, please. I hope it's the last one. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I think for these characters, then intuition connects them with the distant phylogenetic memories of the human species a time scale stretching outside of and beyond the measured clock time of enlightenment rationality. I've chosen here the um, experimental Nordic dark folk band Hylum. Um, uh, they've got various backgrounds. Um, uh, the members come from Denmark, Norway and Germany. They've had experiences in heavy metal, but they've moved into this uh, different kind of pagan folk. You might know some of their music actually because um, one of the guys in the band collaborated uh, to produce the soundtrack for the very popular TV show Vikings, which was um, broadcast on the Canadian History Channel. And I'm going to try and write a bit more about Highlink because I'm really fascinated by them. But I think they encapsulate um, a, a completely different relationship to time and to nature and, and the human animal as one of, of many other entities in the natural world and the natural environment. And it's totally outside of our own capitalist time consciousness. So the, the political prisoners in Joanna Cavena's The Birth of Love, Bridget, the poor 42 year old woman in labour, lapse at key moments in the text outside of the ordinary chronometric time of their stories into this weirdly intuitive temporal realm in which ancient forces assume precedence. Yes, there are problems for sure with the kind of essentialized um, feminism maybe that's being sketched out here but I, I'm still fascinated by the ancient calls on Bridget's body the way that it just instinctively knows what to do and there's lots of passages from her husband's perspective of how um, um, intimidated and impressed he is with how her body just knows what to do at the moment of labour oh, and she's lucky that it's not a very medically interventionist labour I should point out in that story um, and so this insistence then on ancient forces connects the characters with a much larger temporal ambit in which the human subject becomes reconciled to non-anthropocentric timescales. Um, and this is where the, I finish sort of with that thought in this book, but it's my subsequent project for the last few years has been to work much more on um, post-humanist theory, um, environmental humanities type material, because I'm, I really want to think more carefully about these non-anthropocentric and post-anthropocentric timescales. OK, so just um, a couple of concluding remarks, I guess. The um, the few brief examples I've sketched out to you, um, I think maybe or I hope my, my gambit is that they give us um, um, a, a rich and productive set of texts to help develop fluid utopian strategies as one possible response to the current anxieties of the of the time in, in which we live. Um, couched within perhaps I've un unexpectedly within literary fiction rather than full-scale speculative sci-fi worlds, full-scale utopian worlds, the, the, the minimal or even the modest or ambiguous scale at which these utopian moments of hope uh, are operating reveals sure, for sure how problematic literary representations of utopia have come amidst our dark times, but I think rather than being problematic, I think what really strikes me is just how powerful this utopian desire for something better is and to what extent it um, persists. Thank you. That's that's the end of my talk. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Caroline. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing you and see if we can send me live. OK, so um, Amazing, very insightful, lots to think about um, as a result of that. Um, in our hurry to get the screen share started at the beginning, I realised I, I forgot to point out to all our attendees that um, obviously you, you sadly in this format can't share your, your screen or your audio, but you can definitely contribute to the discussion. Um, so there is a live Q&A event function that you can use. Um, you simply type in your questions in there and both Caroline and I will be able to see those. Um, so please do pop questions in there. In fact, we uh, see one now, Caroline, hopefully you do as well. Um, and I'll flip the video back over to you as you answer. But this question here, 
says, thank you for the interesting talk. You spoke a bit about the tendency for contemporary political causes and struggles to return to the past and means of finding ways out of the problems and crises of the present. I'm interested in the underlying politics of this tendency, especially in feminism, of looking back to the past for inspiration and answers. Can you say a bit more on your thoughts on this idea that the leftist past is full of, the poten is full of potential in unrealised projects and possibilities? I think there is a risk that this trend of return can divert energies away from the complexities of the present and that it is a nostalgic search for or attachment to a fantasy of political truth rather than actually useful for present concerns. So thank you for that question. Um, I will uh, send you live, Caroline, uh, to, if you've formulated an answer to, to drop that one on us. Thank, thank you. I can't tell who's asking these questions. It just says anonymous. So yeah. thank you, anonymous number one. Um, yeah, it's a really important, it's a really important question. I mean, I suppose if I could answer it this way, perhaps, um, I, I strongly reject the claim um, that this is nostalgic, and that's because the the model of time that I'm developing, reading through Ernst Bloch's kind of philosophical writings, is absolutely not presentist in that sense. This isn't nostalgia, precisely because it's a much more complicated idea of time, where the 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 unactualized potential of the past um, can be redeemed. But um, none of these things are ever guaranteed. It's absolutely, I mean, Bloch was very clear about this. It is not about looking back to um, the past in a, in a kind of nostalgic idea of utopian plenty and the golden age and all those pastoral traditions of, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, of post scarcity and stuff. It, it's, it's always an active struggle for the left. I mean, he was writing explicitly about leftist politics. Um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a war within discourse and ideology. Um, sorry, the questions now disappeared. So I can't see it anymore. Um, I, I can't oh. the rest of it. Uh, so yeah, I, I don't agree that it's nostalgic. Um, and maybe I wasn't clear enough about that from the start. But there is a section of the book that deals with that. I mean, when I, I mean, it's it's such a long time ago when I started writing this, but you know, back in the late 90s, there was quite a trend of memory studies. It was a boom. Trauma theory was really popular back then. Um, Svetlana Boim had published The Future of Nostalgia and, and things like that. So my project was very much writing against memory studies. I really wasn't. Um, uh, it's not that memory isn't a part of what I do, because obviously there are moments where these characters reflect on previous experiences. But I, I really wanted to try and give a kind of critical density to um, anticipation, to futurity. And that's a very difficult thing to do. And it's very easily um, mocked, I guess, um, or criticised when it comes up in political discourse and things. Um, but yeah, I, I, I was trying to think about the ontological presence of the future. And part part of the one of the chapters on that look, looked briefly at um, Derrida's idea of spectrality and I talked about, you know, um, King Hamlet's ghost and the, the kind of visor effect of, of the spectre returning and, and things. So, yeah, that, I mean, there's lots more discussion that we could have about that. I think the question said something about feminism struggles to re yeah, past. It did. Yeah, so uh, interested in the underlying politics of this tendency, especially in feminism, of looking back to the past for inspiration and answers. Mm. Thoughts yeah. on the idea that the leftist past is full of potential in unrealised possibilities. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, of course. I mean, um, you know, Elaine Showalter's work talking about uh, looking for f female precursors is is full of this idea of how we have to go back and excavate women's writing. We still do that. There are institutional formations for contemporary feminist scholarship, um, you know, like the work of the CWA in contemporary literary studies, for example. Um, I mean, but also um, black feminist writing and um, one of the chapters I looked at the co concept of transmigration, of, of connecting with different kind of networked historical times, and that comes up quite a lot in um, in, uh, in in feminist and post-colonialist struggles. So it is quite a common kind of political tactic, I would say, for writers to have to go back and attempt to redeem, unearth, um, and and bring back to, not bring back to life because that's the wrong way of phrasing it, but. Um, but find a new life for some of those unactualized moments in the past. That Claire Colbrook quote is really helpful there. Um, I hope that answers the question. I'm maybe not the best person placed to answer that question. Um, um, if, if, if anonymous, if you have a follow up on that, pop I'm it in the, in the questions. <laughs> um, 
Oh, uh, Sean, we, 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 yeah, we do have some questions from Sean. So um, she says, uh, uh, hi, Caroline, as you know, utopian studies has been preoccupied with topography and classification and much ink is spilled on defining and defending the boundaries of the literary utopia, dystopia, critical utopia, anti-utopia, Ukrainia, etc, etc. Does your work offer a similarly classificatory intervention or does your project push back against some of this definitional approach? I mean, I hope not. I think, thank you, Sean. I think I probably fell into this trap early on because there is a term I've got of the microtopia, which I mentioned isn't that just, I mean, I need to think more carefully about it, whether it, it, it does relate in some senses to the utopian enclave. In my defence, that was the first thing I ever published as a PhD student. But um, I think I've moved away from that. I, th I think I'm keen to emphasise the search for a, a method. And that, I, I know it sounds boring to some people, but I, I've become even more formalist. I just, um, the, the more time I spend explaining this project and, and, and continuing to work on various strands out of it and beyond it, the more I think there is work to be done for literary scholars to insist on um, a usable hermeneutic. It, it works, uh, as Sean, I'm sure you know, like it relates a lot to Tom Moylan's work and the critical utopias of um, Demand the Impossible, but also um, Angelica Bammer's book on partial visions, which often gets overlooked, uh, similarly excavating and uncovering those kind of littler moments, those smaller moments, the smaller scale. So, I, I yeah, I guess I'm less keen to go into the endless typographies because they, yeah, I, I, I think I agree with you. We're probably on the same page. I don't know how helpful they are in and of themselves. Um, the question about Limitas Sergeant and authorial intention. That's a really good question because um, teaching contemporary literature where the authors are still alive gives us the opportunity to go and interview them, which I've done. Several of the, the authors in this book I did interview at various points over the years. Um, and I bring this up in our MA teaching because I think it's a real problem, actually, that there, there isn't any kind of we're not like the social sciences in the sense that we don't have a kind of satisfactory rubric for how you incorporate author interview material, which we inevitably have to because we're scratching around for um, extra materials that we can use to underpin our research when nothing has been published on these writers sometimes. Um, so there's a selective use of interviews um, to the point that once one interviewed Jim Crace, I, I sent him what I had written about his work and then he responded to that and it in, in effect, I managed to shape a conversation that I knew would be relevant to the topic I was trying to pursue. So it, it's it's absolutely not ideologically um, without its problems. Um, I, yeah, I don't, I, I guess I sit somewhere in the middle in terms of the Lyman Tower Sergeant. I, I mean, I absolutely don't agree that the author has to intend it to be a utopia. So I am fighting back against that position. I am trying to make space for texts to be read as utopian, even if they were not intended to be utopian, and even if very few other people consider them to be utopian. I think it's a test of whether this method works, that you can make the case for a utopian reading of them and then see if colleagues accept it or not. And maybe in the years to come, no one will accept it and I'll fall into a ditch and we can just say goodbye to that idea. Um, but I think that's what I'm trying to do. Right. Um, do keep your questions coming in, folks. Um, for the time being, though, I, I have one if I could put it to you, Caroline. Um, mm. I think uh, you have to forgive me here because this is a very new uh, brand of scholarship to me, but it's fascinating listening. And uh, as someone who comes from a more political kind of sociological perspective on things, um, what occurred to me is the, the general concept of, of time and uh, a utopia is something forward looking and, uh, you know, the past maybe is something historical. Um, and, you know, you talked about um, how capitalism has reshaped time. So these big kind of epochal considerations that we have and how they influence how we perceive time. So the big thing that occurs to me is now is um, the role of the, the climate crisis. Mm. Um, so arguably that's, you know, the biggest, most existential issue that we are dealing with as, as a global population, right? Um, and what interests me is the thought that in many respects, part of what's led us here is um, doing things just because we can. So all of these um, kind of the Anthropocene is, is the large, one of the largest problems that we now have with, with the climate disaster, right? So um, in essence, I guess what I'm saying is a future of avoiding climate catastrophe arguably will involve a return to the past in some of our practices and some of the things that we do um, to kind of undo the damage. 
So that's interesting to me that the utopia we might be looking at in practical terms involved returning to things we'd abandoned because they weren't quick enough or they weren't efficient enough and, and these other things arose out of that. So I guess what I'm wondering is how do you think that might reflect in literature? Um, and or is there even an alternative utopia that, that is not any of the things I'm, I'm talking about? Um, yeah, sorry, a bit convoluted, more of yeah. a dump of thoughts than a question. No, it's it's really interesting um, and it's definitely where my work is situated now. Um, yeah, I mean, lots of lots of ways to approach this. I guess a, a few things to say the the, the popularity of, of post apocalyptic narratives, let's say, because I've, I've sort of been sketching around those ideas. Um, the, there's nothing inherently progressive about imagining disaster and more often than not, they can lead to quite conservative uh, nostalgic, as as anonymous number one suggested, um, uh, visions of a sort of romanticised pre-industrial life, a way of living in which you know rights for women, rights for trans people, and and so on could be um, denied or no longer possible without medical intervention and so on. So um, it's not progressive to just jump outside of capitalist time per se. Um, and the cosy catastrophes of, you know, John Wyndham and J.G. Ballard and the, the new wave science fiction of the sort of 50s, 50, 60s, 70s period um, isn't necessarily that progressive either, although I would still make a case for their aesthetics being progressive in the sense that uh, experimental literary strategies can often be read in that way if you want to. Um, yeah, uh, what we're talking about, climate crisis. I mean, I guess one of the things I'm trying to work on at the moment is um, is a kind of anti-humanism, which is quite controversial. It's not just post-human; it is anti-human. And I'm I'm going back. Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to look back at earlier um, moments of anti-humanism. Um, one of which is the kind of deep ecology movement in the 1980s and activism around kind of the Gaia and saving the biosphere at the expense of humanity. The the idea that we deserve the punishment of our own demise as a species. That idea has resurfaced in various recent texts of ideas of the, the world without us. Um, so I teach the film Homo Sapiens by Nicholas Geierhalter, which looks at this. I'm writing about Lars von Trier's Melancholia, which looks at this, the total annihilation of species extinction and, and was it our fault? Um, I mean, I think what I find curious about that moment is that um, it, it tends to reinforce human exceptionalism by precluding humanity from the natural environment and by denying us our place as animals. Uh, and so I'd much rather take the kind of, you know, Jane Bennett uh, sort of lively materialist, um, new feminist materialist perspective of we are one kind of energy among many others. And so some of the texts that I'm trying to pick out, you know, privilege, um, no, not just anthropomorphized animals, but they privilege inorganic dead matter. Um, so I'm I'm looking at um, N.K. Jemison's Broken Earth trilogy to see what position rock, you know, the stratigraphic record of the planet is given in that narrative. I'm thinking about mycological texts where fungal cultures are given just as an important role as, as the fantasy equivalent of the human characters. So a few different fantasy texts are coming in there. Um, yeah, t time and temporality in the Anthropocene. I, I think the, the easiest way to put it would, would be to go the kind of Donna Haraway in route, which are a lot of um, uh, post-human, ecolo ecological post-humans are people like Rosie Bredotti and other figures associated with Haraway herself, which is to say that we live amid the disaster. And Anna Lernhaupt sings really excellent, The Mushroom at the End of the World does this so brilliantly. Um, to show us that there are, I mean, it's such an explicitly utopian book. It's not, she's not a literature scholar, you know, she's a, what, an anthropologist. Um, going back and looking at the Mats, Matsutake mushroom and, and foraging in Portland, Oregon and, and so on. She's got these fascinating, quite personal anecdotal case studies. Um, but to insist that there is utopian possibility within the wreckage, within the capitalist ruins, um, that's not to deny that this is happening, that anthropogenic climate change is happening, that sea levels will rise, that there will be, we are in the middle of, or we're about to become in the middle of a mass species extinction event. Um, and, I, and I don't think it's irresponsible to persist in utopian endeavour at that time. I think it's actually, it's something that we have to do. We can't cede 
that imaginary, you know, to it to any other um, power, in in my humble opinion. Wow, uh, great. Well, that definitely answered uh, my question in ways that will have me thinking for a while. I think. Um, excitingly, we have a name for our anonymous questions. So, uh, Sophia, thank you very much. Um, he says, sorry, I forgot to put my name on the original question. Thank you for the response. Very interesting and helpful. I guess my interest in nostalgia comes from the tendency for references to the past to be a bit simplified or positive in ways that evade conflict and complexity. Thinking, for example, about slogans and the currency they have in their ability to be easily reproduced and exchanged and decontextualized too. Uh, we're coming up to the end of the session, but uh, maybe if there's a comment on that, that would be great. Oh, thanks, Barbara. That means a lot. Yes. Thank you. And a, a thank you from Barbara. I'll get those published so you can read them, everyone. Oh, Sean says something about out of the woods. Disaster communism. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, disaster communism is Re Rebecca Solnit um, looking back to, I forget um, where she gets the term from, it's somebody else. Um, yes. Yeah, I need to think more about that, Sean. Maybe I'll keep in touch with you. <laughs> Well, I think um, as we're wrapping up, we're heading closely towards our, our scheduled end of meeting time at two. So if there are any last minute questions or comments, do pop them in the Q&A um, and you can interact with them as well as I've just seen a, a like for Barbara. Um, so uh, hopefully this this format has worked for everybody. We're, we're really grateful to you for attending. Uh, and of course, very, very grateful to, to you, Caroline, for your time and for a fascinating talk. Uh, lots of food for thought to go away with. Um, I think uh, if people, you know, they, they can connect with you by email, but there's a note there that, you know, it it, it may be a, a little while because of your uh, dense inbox. Um, but, you know, uh, Caroline said she'll, she hopefully will get to you eventually. So if you do have anything that you want to follow up on, do drop her an email. Um, so it just remains for me to say uh, thank you very much, everybody, uh, for being in attendance today. Uh, we, we hope you've enjoyed it and found it accessible and useful. Um, and thanks again to you, Caroline, for, for your time and, and sharing that fascinating work. And I presume that the book that you talk about, um, if people are looking to, to buy it, to access it, where, where can that be found? Uh, it, all good bookshops. Um, Cambridge website has it. Uh, Cambridge Studies in 21st Century Literature and Culture. You can just Google Utopia Contemporary British Novel. It should come up. Yeah, that's fantastic. Not Amazing stuff. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> no problem well uh thanks again and uh i guess take care everybody have a wonderful back holiday weekend and, and thanks once again to you caroline for your time thank you bye everyone thanks, thanks all take care